All right, Second Thessalonians chapter one. The songs we sang this morning. Faith I follow on the path. There's a phrase at the end of every uh, stanza that says, keep my gaze on only you, Lord. And I picked that song because of uh, that phrase that matches with our text this morning. Second song we sung, uh, it's still the cross. Um, to live for him with every breath. And then you are the Christ. No other name deserves my praise. Just read the sum of Deuteronomy this morning and how God reiterated the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy means second law, second time the Ten Commandments are given. And the reason for uh, the second time is so that Israel would see as they're going into the promised land that there is no other God like God. No other God can deliver uh, from the Red Sea, from the Egyptian army like God. No other God can provide manna from heaven, quail, water from a rock. No other God can part the Jordan River. No other God can push uh, the town of Jericho right into the ground. No other God rescues. Because there is no other God. There's only one. And as we look at our glorious Savior today, this context of 2 Thessalonians matches first in that it's meant to encourage a suffering church. 1 Thessalonians 5 tells the uh, Thessalonians that they need to comfort and encourage one another because they're not going to face God's wrath like the unsaved will in 1 Thessalonians 5. Now in 2 Thessalonians, we get more detail about not experiencing the wrath of God because they are rescued. And if we are rescued people, where should our focus be? Our focus should be on one person. His name is Jesus. And if he appears to be not worth looking at, or when we look at him, we don't see what he wants us to see, we need to reevaluate what we're looking at. I don't know if you've ever been to the eye doctor and it was things were blurry in your life until you went to the eye doctor. They have you look through something and tell, hey, read, line, whatever. And you say, I, and you just make up stuff because you can't see it. It's blurry. And they start changing the settings on their, um, on their opticals until it looks uh, not blurry, until it's clear. And, oh, now the, the words or the letters there, the shapes, didn't change. But you couldn't observe them because of degeneration of your eyes. Your eyes weren't working as God designed them to work, so you needed contacts or glasses to help you. And I don't know how often you go back to uh, the eye doctor. I'm assuming it's every year or two uh, because you expect your eyes not to get better with time and age. You expect them to get worse. And there are times in our Christian life, especially when we suffer like the Thessalonians, that the glory of God gets a little blurry, that we don't see him as he is, as he wants us to see him. And we can't see God on a website. Can't see God in a store. You can't see God. You can see a little bit of his handiwork here in creation with looking at trees and grass and the sky um, and these rocks that God has made. Uh, and you say, wow, God is very creative. His imagination is without measure. Yes, but that is creation. There is a very specific way that God wants us to see him, and it's through his son, Jesus. And so whenever we as Christians, before we were Christians, we didn't see Jesus in all of his glory. And at our salvation, we saw a glorious Savior and a really needy person. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We could not save ourselves. We tried to do good works and it never took away our bad works until Jesus says, come unto me all ye are weary and heavy laden. I'll give your soul rest. 
Rest is only found after your sin is removed. After we saw last week, as there is full atonement, full covering. There's nothing between you and God. And you can live this life, and God wants us to live, always focused on him, always confessing sin after we know our Savior, and we'll see his glory. From one glory to another, he's going to change us. And you and I will only be changed if we see the glory of God on a daily basis, almost on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And as First Thessalonians said, we're to pray without ceasing and rejoice always and in everything give thanks. And when we're doing those three things, we're seeing the glory of God and we're praising God because of his glory, we're rejoicing always because he is glorious and he's working. And we want to talk to him in prayer. And we see his handiwork. And even if we go through trials, like the Thessalonians are going through persecution and affliction and suffering, they were able to, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God. And if God is allowing this, and he's a glorious God, we got to be okay with that. So now the Thessalonians are told in this, uh, this book of Second Thessalonians is about the second coming of Christ. It's a, it's a glorious thing. You read Revelation, especially 19 and 20, and there is one word that can summarize that, and that's glory. What is glory? It is majesty. It is beauty that will blow your mind. You may see men, you may see a really nice car, really powerful truck. You say, wow, that's nice. I'd like to have a Lamborghini, or I'd like to have a truck that would haul anything or you ladies may see a house or someone that's decorated a house. You're like, wow, I'd love to live there. I'd love to be able to decorate like that. Well, we're going to see the glory of our savior today and we need to focus on him because when he comes, the focus is not on us. It's not on his destruction. Really? It's not on people. It's not on creation. The glory that we need to focus on at the end of time, we need to focus on until we get there, is Jesus Christ. He is glorious. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the one that we keep our eyes on all the time, even while we're suffering persecution or affliction or sorrow. And when you see the glory of God, if you are really scared of COVID-19, you see God in his glory, you see Jesus Christ in his majesty, you say, like the hymn writer, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And the things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If you're focused right now on me, you don't really see you have peripheral vision. You can see a lot. But if you held your hand up in front of me and you focused on your hand like I'm doing, I can see blurry all of you or most of you. <laughs> but I can't focus on you and my hand at the same time. And there are things in life that come and persecution and, and affliction and sorrow can come in between us and God. And we just look at the problem and we can't see the glory of God. And Paul's going to help the Thessalonians to say, you know what? You are suffering affliction and sorrow and persecution your life is hard but don't focus on your life don't focus on the temporary focus on eternity and what will help you focus on eternity is your glorious savior is coming so let's look at second thessalonians i'm going to start in verse eight because it, it goes with verse nine and i stopped at verse eight last week and i have to correct something that i said last week so verse eight Jesus is going to grant relief to those who are afflicted in verse 7. And in verse 8, he's coming with mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So how does this passage encourage us? doesn't sound like a very encouraging things well if you know christ this doesn't apply to you as first thessalonians 5 you, the thief in the night christ coming second the second time isn't going to surprise christians because we're not of the night we're of the day and now here he says 
if you're being afflicted, God's going to grant you relief. When Jesus comes with his mighty angels and flaming fire, he's going to inflict vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel. I said last week that was one group, and I got some help uh, Greek-wise, and there's an article in front of each of those phrases. So they're two different groups um, and distinct groups. Those who don't know God, our natural person, natural man doesn't know God. I've had people tell me, I know nothing about God. My kids know nothing about God. And they admit that to me. And so I'm like, okay, we can help you know God. Romans 1 says, when they see God, they wouldn't glorify him as God. So some people are willingly ignorant of God. And some people are very distracted with the cares of this world and just don't have time for God. And they look at Sunday as a day to sleep in or rest or go, go somewhere and have fun. Uh, and it's not, why should you go to church and focus on God or his word? It doesn't make sense to them. So the natural man doesn't know God, but there are people that don't know God. And then the second group of people in verse eight, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So here are two different people in, in um, the life of Jesus. One, and in the, in the uh, time that he was tried, there was Herod, the king, and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, Jewish people, and there was Pontius Pilate. Pilate would probably be in the first group. He didn't know God. Whenever he told Jesus, don't you know I have the authority to release you? And Jesus said, you don't have any authority over me except to be given to you from God. And Pilate was surprised that Jesus said that to him. Like, who do you think you are? And when Pilate stands before God, he sees Jesus. He's like, you look familiar. Yeah, you didn't know God, Pilate. That's why you allowed him to be crucified. Okay, he's in the first category. We may need help with this, or we may have to put something down. Um, the second group of people, so Pilate's in that first group who didn't know God, probably raised a pagan or raised in Caesar worship or other gods of the Romans. But then there was a Jewish people around Jesus who were causing the crowd to say, crucify him, crucify him, don't let him go. We'd rather have Barabbas than Jesus. And this would have been the religious leaders, uh, Herod, who uh, should have known better. And they are standing in the presence of their Messiah, the long promised one. And if you were a Pharisee, you knew the Old Testament well enough and you could compare Jesus' life and the Old Testament. You'd say, this guy fulfilled everything that the Messiah was supposed to fulfill. And here is all of us, mainly, except for a few, like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And they said, we're not, we're not with this group. But these people rejected Jesus and would not listen to him and would not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. They would not accept him as Lord. Instead, when he claimed to be Jehovah, I am of the Old Testament, they picked up stones and were ready to kill him. He showed them he was the I am. He showed them he could make bread. He showed them he could open the eyes of the blind. He showed them over and over and over again that he was God and they did not obey the gospel. Okay, so the Jewish leaders who knew the Bible, they knew God. It wasn't an ignorance of God for them. It was they knew God, but they're rejecting God. Okay, so there's a, there's a difference here. So, but both of these groups at the end of time are going to be judged by God. So the two categories of unsaved people, those who don't know God and those who won't obey the gospel, but they're all under the umbrella of they're going to be judged by God. And to encourage the Thessalonians who are suffering, they're not in those groups. If you hear people who don't obey the gospel and you're thinking, that's not me, I obeyed the gospel. When I heard the gospel, and it may have taken you uh, several times of hearing it or, or several uh, presentations of the gospel and how God works in all of us differently and how he worked in Tyler's different than how he worked in me and how he worked in all of you. But if you are here today and you have obeyed the gospel, this passage shouldn't bring you terror at all. It should bring you great trust. Your faith should grow as the Thessalonians faith is growing. Okay. So when we hear of God's coming in great power and glory and infl inflicting vengeance, we realize he's not coming after me. He's not coming after you if you've obeyed the gospel. If you haven't obeyed the gospel and you're watching 
or you're here today, you should be extremely terrified. And that's probably mild. I can't tell you how scared you should be. I can't get enough ways of explaining if you read this and you have not obeyed the gospel, you should be shaking in your chair because this is you. You are going to be under the mighty hand of a glorious, majestic, powerful, sovereign judge. And he, what's he going to do here in verse 8? He is going to inflict vengeance on you. Verse 9, you will suffer the punishment. Punishment means to pay the penalty. Okay, if you have a punishment for speeding, the officer gives you a, you have to pay the penalty. What's the penalty? Well, it depends on how far you were going above the speed limit. And he writes you a ticket. And that ticket tells you you either go to court or you got to pay this fine. A fine is a punishment. For kids, if you were punished as a kid, I really appreciate my parents and they're punishing me. Uh, they caused me to pay the penalty for my foolishness over and over and over again. I'm glad they didn't let me get away with selfishness and sin. God is going to judge the world. Look at verse 9. They will suffer the punishment of what? What is the penalty for rejecting Jesus, not obeying the gospel, and not knowing God? Verse 9 says, eternal destruction see if if you and i go home and our house is on fire and you lose everything in your house everything's burned you got nothing left and i thought if my house catches on fire in the middle of the night what would i take out i don't know if you've had that thought like you can't take out everything I'm not taking out my couches guys grab the other end i'm not going to do that they can burn but i probably will take out my wedding album of pictures Okay, I would take out my, probably my laptop and my cell phone. Okay, things that are easy to carry, things that mean something to me are valuable. But I'm not taking out my bed. I'm not taking out my shoes. I'm not taking out stuff that I can replace easily. See, if you lose your house, that'd be very unfortunate. We as a church would try to help you to get back on your feet financially and uh, restore some things that you lost. But that's temporary. You can work, you can save money again, you can replace your things, you can go and, and replace couches, and you can replace a house. But you cannot, in this passage, you cannot replace eternal destruction. You and I were made for eternity. We are not like animals, we're not like trees or grass. We're not like this building here. We're not like the pavement that we're sitting on or the chair you're sitting in. We were made for eternity. And you will either be eternally saved or eternally destroyed. And this passage says, if you don't obey the gospel of Jesus, you will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. There is no relief from eternal destruction. There's no going back when you breathe your last physical breath. Eternity begins. Eternal paradise in heaven with the Lord or eternal destruction. You and I were made to not be able to comprehend eternity. We can't do it. You can try to think of a thousand years or 10,000 years or a million years. And before you know it, your mind is going to go into overload and not the smartest person on the face of the earth can comprehend eternity. You know why? Because God made us that way so that we'd fear him and turn away from our evil and obey the gospel. Because there's a glorious Savior coming. And he wants you to be with him. He wants you to enjoy a life that is rejoicing always and praying without ceasing and in everything giving thanks. God wants you to enjoy life, a life that's full of grace and peace and truth. And saved from eternal destruction. However, many people reject Jesus. And eternal destruction is coming for them. This is why we encourage you to hand out tracts and talk to people. Because eternity is a long time to be wrong. 
Verse 9. What is eternal destruction? How does he describe it? He describes it two ways here in verse 9. Away from two things. From the presence of the Lord. What makes hell hell is there's hopelessness. What causes a lack of hope in hell for all eternity? Or a lake of fire. It's the absence of the presence of the only one who can give hope. That's what makes hell, hell. God's presence is, he's everywhere, right? So he has to purposely remove his presence from the lake of fire, from the bottomless pit. You can read about in Revelation 20. Extremely fearful. You should, you should be extremely fearful if you haven't trusted Jesus yet. You're going, you're headed for a life, an eternity that's involving destruction. You're away from God's presence and then the presence of the Lord, probably the Lord Jesus. And then the second phrase in verse nine, and away from the glory of his might. He's got all this power to save you. And you say, no, God, I'm, I'm all set. I don't need your rescue. I don't need your help. And you're drowning in an ocean of sin. And he gives you a life raft and says, jump on, climb aboard, we'll save you. And you're like, no, I got this. I can tread water. And waves are crashing over you. And you're like, no, you can't save yourself. Good works have never taken away bad works. It doesn't work that way in our culture either. You can't do enough good works to take away a speeding ticket or illegal drugs or anything else that you could break the law. Good works don't take away bad. So it is with a holy God and a just judge. He will judge you. He will cause you to be apart from his presence and away from the glory. You know what makes heaven heaven? God's glory. It's not your and my attire, or whatever we can imagine that we're going to wear. Whatever we're going to imagine we're going to play. I don't know if we're going to play harps or not. Are we going to have wings? I don't really know. What's your mansion going to look like? I don't really know. God doesn't tell us. Because heaven's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God and his glory. And we as Christians know that when we trust Jesus as our Savior, God sets us free to be, enjoy eternal life, which we realize at the moment of our salvation, life's not about me. And this life is not about me. It's about the glory of God, too. Oh, it sets us free from trying to protect all of our stuff from getting destroyed. Protect our houses from being invaded by mice and bees and termites and everything else that can destroy our house. To, to protect our car from rust and, and uh, breaking down. Protect all of our stuff and we don't have to worry about that. Life's about the glory of God. All that stuff is just details. And the end of time, the... the Thessalonians needed to be encouraged about what life's really about and the end of time sets an eternal perspective for people to say you know what life's about the glory of Jesus Christ verse 10 when Jesus comes on that day a specific day Christ is going to come in first Thessalonians 5 it's like a thief it's going to surprise those who aren't ready for him we as Christians aren't going to be surprised when Jesus comes again verse 10 says on the day to be glorified in his saints and we marveled at among all who have believed among our, because our testimony to you was believed. There's a lot here in verse 10. Okay, so let me, there's three phrases. The first phrase says, he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints. What makes us different than the unsaved people? If unsaved people look like us, they can talk like us at times. They can love their spouse and their kids and be sacrificing. And here we are next to unsaved people, and outwardly we can dress like us. And they are destined for eternal destruction, and we for eternal life. And what's the difference? The difference is this. God's glory is here. It's in us. The person of the Holy Spirit lives inside of every believer and makes us worthless pieces of dust valuable. 
we're all going to go back to the dust. Our body's going to go in the ground and we're going to be eaten by worms. That's a great thought, isn't it? That this is what physically we have to look forward to. Your body starts breaking down. The older you get, the more things don't work right and you're headed for the grave. But when you know Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you and it's his glory. And at the end of time, what separates the wheat and the tares, God's people and the world, is God's people have the glory of God in them. And here we are standing with Jesus, and he is glorified, and we are glorifying him because we're not destroyed. And all we did to, to not be destroyed is we obeyed the gospel of Jesus. And we wanted to know him. And God worked in us to make us to want to know him. And we're giving glory to our Savior because we all deserve to be here, eternally destroyed and away from the presence of the Lord. The God who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, he's made us alive. And by grace, we've been saved. And so at the end of time, the Thessalonians who are suffering and suffering on this earth, they go to heaven and they've got this in mind. When we, when we get to the end of time, God's going to glorify himself in us. Verse 10, and people who are alive who know Christ are called saints. That's tremendously encouraging. If we don't have to wait for us, us to die, people to pray uh, in our name for uh, someone to be healed and a church to declare us a saint. God declares you a saint, a holy one, as soon as you trust Jesus as your savior. So at the end of time, the first phrase is to be glorified in his saints. The second, to be marveled at among all who have believed. Commentator said, the word among there is also the word in. So while we as saints are going to be marveling at Christ, I think the idea here, there are two other groups that marvel at Jesus' glory. Let's go back to Acts um, 13. We have gone through the book of Acts, but I don't think I pointed this out, or I don't remember pointing it out. And if I forgot that, you probably have forgotten if I did. So let's look at Acts 13. There are two groups that marvel besides, besides the, um, the saints, the, the righteous people, God's people at the end of time. Acts 13 and verse 41. And he's quoting Habakkuk 1, 5. Paul's preaching here, I believe, to uh, Jewish people. I'm talking about the law of Moses and then the prophets, the Old Testament, verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish. For I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. See the word astounded there? Same word, uh, marvel, I believe. To be astounded or marvel, and then you perish. So at the end of time, God's people, or, uh, those who are not God's people, those who are under eternal destruction, will look at us as God's people. They will marvel that, wow. You're just like me. Yeah, but I'm a forgiven sinner. And I offered, I told you about God's forgiveness and you rejected it. And unsaved people will look at Christians and they will marvel and perish. That's Acts 13. That's Habakkuk 1.5. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a likely uh, possible interpretation of 2 Thessalonians. The second option is, um, and possibly both of these options, is uh, Ephesians 3. So on our way back to 2 Thessalonians, stop at Ephesians 3 and verse 10. So in Ephesians 3, verse 10, God saves individuals in Ephesians 2, those who are dead in trespasses and sins. He puts them in a body called the church. That's a mystery. And Ephesians 3 starts to explain this mystery that wasn't before known, that there are Jews and Gentiles. They're all one body in Christ. And the result is, verse 9, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the, for the ages in God who created all things 
so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What are rulers and authorities? Angels. Angels marvel at what? They don't marvel like we do at a comet. I don't know if you saw the comet a couple weeks ago. You can see it. I took some pictures of it. If you want to see it, I'll show you. Um, and uh, there was a comet that passed by. We're going to see the next that comet in 6,000 years. If you're still here, uh, you can see it. Um, but that comet is uh, part of God's wisdom. The rings of Saturn, part of God's wisdom. The sun, part of God's wisdom. All of creation, we can see the wisdom of God in creation. But of all of God's creation, angels desire to see the wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God in one place. Jews and Gentiles, people who have nothing in common, they get together as a church like we're doing right now and praising and focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And while we're very different and come from very different backgrounds and look at life very differently, we're one in Christ. And the angels marvel. They're astounded at God's wisdom when they look at God's people. Okay, so that's, that's another option. So let's go back to Second Thessalonians 10. And uh, probably for sake of time, I'm going to uh, just deal with these two verses today. We'll look at 11 and 12 uh, next week. So the glory of the Lord. So he closes verse 10 with this statement. So he's focused on the glory of the Lord and judging the wicked and exalting the righteous and causing the righteous. The focus here is all on Christ and how he has glory, how people are marveling and angels are marveling at us because of the transformation that Jesus has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his son. And Jesus gets all the glory for us being transferred. So the focus is all on Christ. And then Paul says in the end of verse 10, among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. So here are the Thessalonians. They're suffering. They're afflicted. They're here about eternal destruction away from the presence of God and the glory of his might. And then he says, but you guys are not in that group. You are not going to be eternally destroyed. When, you, when Jesus comes, you are going to be part of what causes angels and unsaved people to see the glory of God. And we as God's people today, we can be the cause of people and even angels marveling at God's wisdom in taking worthless pieces of dust and making us his own. Calling us out of darkness into his light making us who were once dead alive to god and alive forevermore one who hated and blasphemed god and now we're here singing um praises to our savior and singing in faith i follow on the path and we're going to close with a song to god be the glory but he changes here from eternal destruction to Christ gets the glory. And then he says in verse 10, our testimony to you was believed. We told you about Jesus' glory. We told you about coming destruction. We told you about the rescue and you believed it. So you are part of God's glorious future. Doesn't that encourage you? Now imagine you're suffering and you're in jail in the Roman empire. And your leaders of your church are in jail. And Paul writes this letter to you and you're sitting in jail and you're hearing this or someone's visiting you in jail and they read this to you. You're like, wow, that's what I needed. Because jail is miserable in the Roman Empire. There are rats running around. You're probably hungry all the time. Miserable conditions. Your health may be deteriorating. And here someone comes and encourages you with, it's glory coming. This is where we need to focus. Around us all the time, there are people that are in a jail of sin. They're heading for eternal destruction. They don't know God. Some of them don't want to know God, and some of them just don't even know that they don't know God, or they don't, need, they don't think they need God. And we can tell them eternal destruction is coming. Help them to fear the Lord. And those Christians who are struggling 
and suffering. We need to help them take our eyes off of focus on our problems here and the weaknesses that we have and our health is deteriorating and things aren't working well. Take your eyes off of your problems right in front of you and look up. Look up and look to the future because the future is glorious and it's bright for all believers, all saints. Because we have, in verse 10, Christ's testimony, Paul's testimony about Christ to you as believers, you, were, you believed. And now you're part of this glorious truth. We'll look at the prayer at the end. So now for some applications. So what should we be doing? You have the notes. So I'm going to the last slide. Are you terrified or are you trusting? When you see something extremely glorious, there's just two options here. A glorious second coming of Christ. You've got two responses. You can stay terrified and leave thinking, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope what that guy who yelled a lot, I hope that doesn't come to, come to pass. Okay, You can think that. You can turn off a TV. You can turn off the YouTube video. You can turn off. You can close your Bible and say, okay, I hope that doesn't come to pass. Hoping something doesn't happen doesn't change the truth. The truth is Jesus is coming in great power and glory. And you can be on his side. So if you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus, you should be extremely terrified. You shouldn't sleep at night intentionally. So, and I'll tell you that and I'll pray for you that you will be extremely terrified until you submit your life completely to Jesus as your Lord and master. He is a glorious savior, but that glorious savior at the end of time, if you reject him, he is going to be against you. And verses eight and nine are to warn you. Okay. If you do know Christ verses eight and nine and following are not meant to terrify you. They are meant to eliminate fear. Eliminate a focus here on the future and the temp or on the uh, temporary here and on our problems. If you have obeyed the gospel of our glorious Savior, fear is eliminated. And he's going to close this passage here with prayer. And we'll look at that prayer uh, next week. But prayer is promoted. Talking to, the, to our glorious God. We should want to talk to him. Since God will perfectly work out the future, our present should be consumed with desiring God's goodness and working to glorify Jesus' name while trusting in his power. If you don't want to wait till next week, study verses 11 and 12, and that's a, a summary of that. So if you're here today and you're terrified for your soul, please talk to us. Don't leave. If you leave, you're going to go home, turn on the TV, take a nap, eat dinner, whatever, and you're going to forget the terror of the Lord. The world is not terrified of Jesus. You don't get that when you watch TV. Terrified of a lot of other things, but they don't want you to be terrified of a, a coming glorious savior and you need to be terrified of him now is the day of salvation for you and if you're here today as a christian and you've been consumed with the news and your health and a lot of other things that cause you to be afflicted you don't have to fear anything really christ is coming he's glorious he'll take care of all your problems you have to trust him and grow in your faith as the Thessalonians had to grow. Uh, so let's pray, and then we'll uh, sing uh, to God be the glory. Our Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth and the grace that you give us to understand it. Help us as we go from here to have the grace we need to apply it to our lives. Help us not to be content with being hearers only, but that we be doers of the work. Help us not to deceive ourselves by thinking we are pleasing you. Help us to be men and women of prayer. And trust in you. Help us to eliminate things that distract us from uh, your mission on earth for us. And I pray that you would help us to lay aside weights and sins so that we can live for Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and now he's seated at the right hand, your right hand. In power and great glory, he's coming. Help us to live in that reality and be found faithful when he comes. In Jesus' name we pray.